right now. So uh, sometimes people are like, oh, I don't want my picture there. For, <laughs> no, you can't. But anyway, welcome to Mad About Art um, and our hopefully yearly program with Skit, Skip Whitcomb. Um, I'm Helen Shreves. I am uh, one of the founding members of Mad About Art and past president. Um, I want to let you know, Skip, you can unmute yourself when you want to ask a question. Just don't uh, have things on in the background, possibly. Uh, he he think, he wants it to be interactive. Um, Skip has been painting landscapes of the Western United States for over 40 years. He grew up on a ranch in Colorado where his family raised American quarter horses. His childhood instilled in him a love of the landscape of the West. After earning a BFA from Art Center uh, of Design in Los Angeles in 1971, Skip returned to Colorado and began his painting career. An accomplished outdoor painter, Skip has received numerous awards for his landscape paintings in oil and pastels. His work is in numerous major public and private collections. He has participated in numerous gallery and museum exhibitions throughout the country. Last year, uh, Skip spoke to us about color theory and we thank him for returning. Um, welcome, Skip, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Helen. I enjoy the group. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share screen right now, and so that Skip can um, share screen also. Okay. Uh, wait, I just did the wrong thing. Cancel. Let's see. Okay. We had this going, and desktop, share. Ah, there we go. <laughs> I was afraid. I was afraid this technology had jumped on me and had me down by the throat here. All righty. Uh, sure. I would like to start off. I know last last time we uh, we discussed this, we we talked about the various forms uh, that we use as painters uh, to create color harmony. And we went through a number of the the approaches that we that we often use that, that most of the most all of the the really established painters understand and use. And so I'm not going to rehash old ground, but I thought I'd take it a little bit further this time and uh, and discuss the ways that we can use it. And uh, I'm reminded of a um, of a wonderful book. I wish I'd, I'd taken a photograph of the cover, but it's it's a little book that I recommend to all my students. And it's the title is "Stealing Like an Artist," and it's about it's it's just a really comprehensive book about uh, how we study how legitimate ways of studying uh, other painters, those that have gone before us, and even some of those that are, are contemporaries of, of our own, and uh, from all, all aspects of, of painting, from the completely non-objective to the very traditional. So uh, if, you, if you all are interested, I would highly recommend uh, securing a copy of this. You can look it up uh, on, on, on the Google deal and um and amazon is stealing like an artist and it really explains uh as i said these legitimate ways of of borrowing and, and my education was this was there's a strong encourage which is a, nothing more than an offshoot of the students in the old days in the ateliers and the and the uh, and the the uh, great academies uh we're always were always um, designed around, you know, in a major city, because the students would then have access 
to major museum collections. And so they would be sent to the museums where they were allowed to copy paintings uh, for basically to learn how to paint and how to see and how to edit and how to design color, how to design with values and shapes and edges. And I mean, all the aspects that go into painting um, of, of uh, creating a, a, a credible visual uh, statement. And that's for the most part been lost over over the decades in in kind of fallen by the wayside, which is a real shame because that that's a huge part of our education as painters, sculptors, and as 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 ones like you who really enjoy painting and go, and enjoy looking at work. And it would it helps understand the process, and I am using this now uh, this approach. I'm really encouraging this approach with my students in my um, in my mentoring program, and so obviously many of them don't have access to great museum collections and and uh, and paintings to study and to borrow from. So I put images up there and say, OK, now if like the Clifford Still uh, paintings and I and by the way, they have they have absolutely loved the, the Clifford challenge, as I put it, because I asked them to, OK, you design. Look at this. Look at this specific painting of stills and you design a palette a set of colors that would that he used for this particular piece and then you apply that to your concept your painting which will be most likely a traditional piece and oh my gosh it just throws so many doors open for them because they realize okay here is a highly refined painting the still piece and I can borrow that palette and apply it to my concept. So I'm I'm basically assuring myself that I have a very harmonious color statement to build off of. If that if that makes sense to you all, um, it's just such an an invaluable an, an invaluable lesson for them. Plus, in turn. It encourages them to go to the museums or or to, to go to their their books because the quality of reproductions today are are just exquisite, and uh, and really analyze a piece that that speaks to them. You know, they work always strikes a chord with with each one of us, and oftentimes for reasons we can't explain, which is fine because that means you're having that that wonderful. Uh, communication that that conversation with that artist, even though they may have been dead for two hundred years, you still it's it's like talking to them when you can when you can analyze break a painting down and 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 realize that number one there is not one thing in that painting that's there by accident. It's all by design. It has a purpose. And when you you perhaps see a certain intersection uh, of shapes and say to yourself, well, now I wonder why he or she did that. Then you start seeking out, working off of that basic alignment, which I'm going to kind of do a little diagram here. Let's see here. Let me get my, my brush tool up. And we'll see. Okay, it looks like we've got a red one. Ah, we do. Okay, uh, let's make a bigger one. This is a very large image uh, file here. We'll go a little bit bigger. Okay. Uh, this is a painting I just finished. Uh, it's it was a commission piece or is a commission piece for the new Benson Hotel. If I some of you maybe have not heard of that, it's it's 
uh, right adjacent to the Anschutz Medical Center. And it's a it's become a, what we might call a boutique hotel. It's a beautiful facility. I haven't actually been there yet, but they've invited all of us that they commissioned uh, work from for a, a reception, little opening deal, so we can see where all this work is um, and its environment. So uh, this is a, a four feet square piece. And so I'm very pleased to have it there in their collection. And what I, I thought I would just use this as an example. Now, you might, the first thing you might notice, you get past the subject, just forget about the subject and, and look at the way uh, the shapes go together. And you might first notice this, whoops, didn't want to go that far. I meant to go right here. This intersection right here. And and it is, you, to help understand how important this intersection is, it's basically the 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 skeletal structure that the whole the whole organization of shapes is is hanging on. So this is what I built. It built the rest of the image around. Was I needed that that. The, the intersection of uh, an important intersection of shapes here uh, to anchor, if you will, the, the everything else that, that comes after this and how, how do I, how do I build off of this intersection so that uh, from a design a compositional uh, uh, point of view or a position, it all makes sense visually. And you'll notice, and I've, there's a uh, another sub uh, sub intersection right here. And I wanted to make sure that all these all these these uh, diagonal lines lead to the same point. And rather than put a really major feature like this taller tree, I use it. I wanted to keep it a little more subtle, and I went with a a uh, little bit smaller vertical anchor here. And if we extend this line up, there's a very delicate transition right in here to anchor top to bottom. And, um, you know, at the risk of, of getting into the weeds too much on this, uh, this this isn't something that I borrowed from another painter, but I learned to arrange shapes this way from studying the work of Gustav Klimt. Oh. And he his his designs, you you know many, many of his paintings are on a square. And I was introduced to Klimt when I was in school. And he was kind of, for me, the father of understanding composition. And so I've I've really uh, been forever in 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 debt to him and and my instructor that pointed me to him to understand what composition is and how it works because there are so many different ways of dividing space and that's all it is I mean that's that's just really is dividing the space within those four edges into a, a, a visually stimulating image. So, uh, and my, and I, I worked with a limited palette on this, which I was basically a, um, 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 <laughs> I believe it was a seventh, what we call a seventh chord, which is like a musical chord and it's based on the intervals between between notes that which which creates a, a a musical chord and for in painting if you think about it and this is kind of a we're backing up just a little bit with a review here on color uh, and excuse me I'm reaching for my handy dandy color wheel <laughs> and and uh for reasons of design and and planning, um, most all of us work off of one of these basic 
color wheels and it and it has uh 12 colors arranged just like the face of a clock and a seventh chord uh works off of intervals of a four three two three spacing on the 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 hands of the clock so you can see here I've, I've i don't know if you can see that or not but you can see i've drawn out those little uh triangles on there and then i can rotate them around and if uh let's say the yellow right here is uh, a key ingredient or let's see i'll go um the blue violet was actually a key ingredient you can see it right down there in the corner so <clears throat> i can go based off of that that blue violet then i can start counting my intervals around on the face of my color clock so to speak and i can find related colors uh that would that would be based off of this blue violet so i could then if i didn't like the interval that's showing up here then i can always move it to let's see let me get my finger on that. okay right there i can move this around and say all right now what what different set of colors does this give me now but still based off this blue violet and so i'll get a different assortment here and i can go all the way around like that with the with the seventh chord those those intervals must stay the same in order to to maintain the harmony uh, and say uh for instance uh, if, if we went with 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 the uh what it's showing me right here so i have a blue violet i have a red i have a yellow and a blue green that so, would be yeah, my uh, yep we can't this to helen we can't see your wheel your color wheel oh uh, i you can't we would have to stop the screen sharing to do that but just to let you know that if you oh i'm sorry i mean i'm holding it up and i can see it in the thing <laughs> yeah. i apologize for that guys i darn it i should have i should have put a wheel up there so you could talk about this uh in greater length but let let's just let's just proceed from here so we'll say i have a blue violet a red a yellow and a blue green that are that would make up my basic comprise my basic core palette for this specific painting now my yellow doesn't necessarily have to be a bright yellow it could be a subdued yellow like a yellow ochre uh the same with my blue green uh blue green would be a viridian and uh say well that's a that's a little bit harsh for what i have in mind here so rather than um uh, a viridian i might mix a blue green that is say for instance an ultramarine blue and a yellow ochre that would give me a blue green but it would be a very quiet version of the blue green so in other words what i'm trying to say is it that <laughs> as restrictive as as a color plan may initially seem it's really wide open so it's there's because we have so many variations of colors that we can introduce or we can mix and make them uh still maintain that harmony so that's basically the color plan that i used for this piece now i'd like to move on to another piece this is a bastian lepage who was a um, a belgian painter that everyone in the in the mid to in the mid 1800s that went to study with the great academies in in uh, Munich and in Paris, would make a pilgrimage to Lepage. 
because he was considered the the grand old the the the, the master of uh, broken color of 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 outdoor painting of of this whole new renaissance of of ways of seeing and uh and again i've learned so much from from studying this particular painting and it's it's a large piece that hangs at the met in new york and it's one of those that it's like the clifford still museum when i go to new york to the met I go specifically, he, Lepage, th this painting, Joan of Arc, is one of them that I can never get enough of. Simply to see, to study the way he applied paint, the way he used his color, whether it was directly painted or glazed in, uh, his basic color plan. If I were going to borrow this palette, what would I, how would I make it up? How would I make up a palette that would that would uh, be very similar to this? And um, and so it's it it's been it's so invaluable to to study not only for as I said not only for painters but but for those who enjoy painting like you all and realize that these paintings are like a a wonderful novel. And we all have our favorite books that each time we read them, that we something new is revealed that we hadn't noticed before. And that's that's the wonder of of great paintings because we 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 see things they're they're new every time we look at them. And uh, just simple little things like like again, we'll go back to uh, compositionally. Can you hear me okay out there, guys? Yeah. Just a thumbs up. And... Yep. Okay. Uh, you just notice little things like the intersection of this this tree branch coming down into the into the figure's head, um, and extending that line on down through the body, down through here, and you see that subtle intersection here with the bottom of the canvas. That's not an accident. That's an anchor. Uh, the same way with the, the the tree branches up here, they're all leading down into the figure. These sweeping movements that are uh, rhythms of the sweep of the arm. You see, they're just. I mean, everywhere you 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 start finding these wonderful curves that really serve as envelopes. Whoops! Didn't want to do that. Uh, they they serve as an envelope to bring the eye right back to this major figure. Not like you really needed directions because it's it's such a dominant shape in this composition. It's the area of highest contrast. And by that, I mean, there's nothing else in the painting that has as as high a light and dark relationship as, the uh, the the bust of this figure. There's there's no contrast in here that is stronger than the contrast in the head. There is there is no nowhere will you find that extreme contrast. So uh, it leaves no doubt in the viewer's mind where he's wanting you to look. And uh, as a complex as this color plan initially appears. It's really a, a, a quite simple uh, approach. It's mainly is a triad of yellow, blue, and red. So earthy reds, his blues are, are rather subdued. You can see the brightest note of blue up here in the corner. So that's telling you that's probably more like a cerulean blue. It's very delicate or a cobalt blue that's been really um, um, brought down in chroma, so it's it's this subtle, and um, and these greens in here are most likely a combination of his 
is uh, ye or yellow and, and blue and using a transparent blue, then he can create this green in here that he can glaze in because it will maintain the transparency. And I, that, which is, that's getting into a whole nother uh, technical aspect of painting, but uh, nevertheless, it's, it's a, it's a very straightforward palette. Now let's, uh, oh, this, I've, I put this in, this is a little thumbnail study in gouache that I did uh, a few months ago as a concept for a painting. And uh, just in, in the, in the basis of my color plan on this is simply what we call a double complement. So red and green, uh, orange and blue. And I can pull, I, it just, it works very well for this combination. You can see the green is a very muted green. My reds are very muted reds. And uh, the yellow, is, or I mean, the orange is not a screaming orange, but a, a somewhat toned down orange. And by mixing orange and blue, I get grays. So I get a full range of grays with this, the same as the, the, the reds and, and, and greens. And that gives me uh, so another range of wonderful grays. They can be reddish grays. They can be greenish grays. It can so there, there's so much more range in this within this very restricted palette, and uh, a double complement is one that I use quite often because it just offers up such a, a wonderful, rich palette of grays that that really. Grays are the glue that holds a painting together, that holds your color statement together. And it's it's how you use those and then how and how you reserve those those little notes of almost pure color, then they really begin to come alive uh, because they're being played off of all these other grays. And you can see, I mean the these these oranges in the in you know through that gap in the hills there uh, all of a sudden takes on a great presence. So, but this painting is is primarily cool. The primary cool colors with a touch of of hot color. So it's that's another decision that we make uh, with with color is okay. Is it going to be mostly cool with a few warms? It's going to be mostly warm with a few cools. In this case, it's mostly cool with a few warms. And uh, is it going, you know, the, these are all compositional decisions that we make uh, going along the way that, that is the foundation of, of building a painting. Uh, I wanted to show you this wonderful Edward uh, Compton uh, painting English painter. He and his son were were uh, uh, very famous mountaineers and painters. In uh, they were English, but they worked uh, primarily in the in the Alps, and uh, and actually climbed and hiked up into these these this rugged country. And they would both do these wonderful little watercolor studies. And this is a tremendous example, just such a glowing example of a complementary palette. It's a, it's, a, it's a blue and orange palette. And just thinking that practicality dictates how much you can carry when you're, when you're actually climbing using you know, technical climbing ropes and, and your climbing gear, and you're not going to be able to carry a lot of stuff with you. So... These guys would go up there and do these exquisite little watercolor studies and then come back down and do these huge masterpieces that were are just a, a feast for the eye, um, completed paintings. And they're not a big name over here in the U.S., but they are they're huge uh, figures in the painting world, especially the landscape world in Europe, throughout Europe. So uh, 
just thought I'd share that one with you. Uh, let's see here. You can't quite see. Okay. Uh, and we'll put this one in there. This is one of uh, mine. I, oops, didn't want to do that. Let me go up in size. Woo, not quite that big. But here's another piece. It's uh, 36 by 40 inches. And um, the, uh, this, the concept for this particular piece was from a trip, a painting trip I took with a friend of mine over to Steamboat Springs one winter. And um, I had a little, uh, I did a little on the spot study of this, this ranch and the horses and it was actually quite different. But I came back and, and really recomposed this and, and orchestrated the whole, the whole piece. And this is mainly a orange and blue and a red and green. And you will not really see any, very little notes of green in this painting, except right over here in this house, it's peeking through. That is a very subdued green, but I needed that combination for some of the reds, which are not really showing up uh, in this particular digital image, but there are some richer uh, earthy reds down in, in here along the baseline of, of this composition and over in here in the notes. Mostly, as you can see up here, there are some subtle greens up here in this distant mountainside through here. They're then repeated down here with that little building. And, uh, but the bulk of this, as you can see, is orange and blue. So I've got my blues in the, in the distant shadows up here, the blues in the, in the snow. And these are surprisingly in real life are not as bright a blue as you think, but I needed the orange to take the edge off of those blues so that it started to, it would, it would lay down on the ground and create this, this sense of, of looking across uh, this big snowy pasture where these, these horses are feeding. So it's, when we, when we start in on a painting, we're not, we're rarely thinking about the subject. We're thinking about the painting and how, how what do I need to do to build this painting? And you will see evidence of this in the Still Museum. So let's go over here and look at a couple of Clifford's pieces. I, I love this one. I just, and what I tell my students is, all right, can you come up with a palette that will duplicate this feel and then apply it to a piece of your own that uh, quite obviously is likely going to be a nocturne, isn't it? Well, yeah, that's what it looks like. I said, okay, you're already halfway through the race. Then you 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 understand how you can use a set of colors such as this, and it just, as I said, it just opens our eyes so quickly to how we can go in there and borrow concepts, borrow ideas from great paintings and make them our own. And this is what all the great painters that went before us, they, they, uh, they hoped that the, the, the path that they had created would then allow painters who came after them to build off of what they had discovered. And this was, I mean, just readily accepted, again, back in, the, in, the, in those great times with the academies and the ateliers and the reasons for going to the museums and, and uh, copying paintings. It was um, because you realize Again, as as I'm getting repetitious here, but 
uh, you, you realize that there's nothing there by accident. And every note, every, every value, every edge is there by plan. And, uh, and then as a student or as a, so, someone who really enjoys the, the, the literary aspect of studying a painting and, and breaking it down and, and understanding why things are the way they are, it just increases the level of joy uh, when you go to the museum and study these, because now you, you begin to really look beyond the surface, beyond the subject or lack of subject, and begin to, it, it, it's, it's, it's like talking to that painter. And uh, that's why I, I really enjoy going and talking to Clifford, <laughs> so to speak. But uh, here's another that uh, that is just a beautiful. And most most of the time, Clifford's uh, palette was not is very simple. And to see what he did with it, I mean, this is a basic primary triad of of yellow, blue, and red. And I mean, it's so obvious when it's pointed out. Here's your red. Here's your blue right here. Whoops, having trouble guiding that thing. And of course, here's this huge area of yellow. And uh, to get this delicate violet, well, he's got a cool red up here. And he's got a cool, I mean, the blue that he's using is, is well, right here, you can see, you can see it at its greatest intensity. And that's what you look for because that's how you'll determine what kind of blue he was using. But by this mixing with this cool red over here, he gets this very delicate violet in here. And to, to play as a complement, violet and yellow complements. And so it just immediately creates a stimulating color statement. And one that is very harmonious, sticks together, holds together, as a, a beautiful orchestration of color and shapes. And for the life of me, for years, I've studied Stills' uh, work, trying to figure out compositionally what he was thinking. And with 99% with of the artists, you can, you can pretty quickly figure out what sort of a compositional structure this painting is built on. With Clifford, no dice. It is the man is is just a, a complete uh, mystery, and and there's no other way to 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 explain it. And I I feel like I'm pretty darn knowledgeable about composition, about how things go together, and that's why I guess that's why there's a little bit of masochism in me that might might go keeping. I, well, keeps me going back to study Stills' work because I, darn it, I have to figure, I know I can figure this out. Well, it's like a Chinese puzzle. I, I, I don't know. I honestly, I have, I don't have a clue other than I sure like the way he broke that space up. I just think that is very exciting. And his contrast of edges, if we just look at it, go in and study it strictly from the point of view of, okay, I'm going to study the edges of this painting and see where is lost and found edges. Where are those sharpest edges? He wants me to look there where those sharp edges are. So my eye, of course, keeps going back up. Whoops, dang it, I don't know why. I, my eye keeps going right back up to that. I mean, it's such a jagged note up there with, with those hard edges uh, all around it, almost like a almost like a lightning strike. And, and then he's playing it off of these, look at this edge down in here. I'm gonna see if I can take that up bigger because this is a, see, this is a good image. And see how subtle that is. I mean, it's just magical what he does. And it, it's, it's so much fun to, to look at those things. And you realize I, as, as a painter, I look at this now. Okay, 
I mean, I am one that I like, I like to use more paint. I like to use more material as it were, because I, I love the tactile quality of, of the paint itself and as it goes down on canvas. And I look at these and I, I am immediately, you can tell, dang, he loved doing this. This just felt good. And you put paint down like that and you control those edges. And it's just, it's, you, you go to a, a place in your brain that is, is uh, you're in a, you're in your own world. You're in a whole different world. And it's, yeah, um, people look at me askance when I say, you know, I'm old school. I love the smell of good turpentine. <laughs> and it makes the studio for me. And so I keep good turpentine in the studio. It's like perfume and linseed oil. God, and those two together is just immediately says studio it says there's an escape here uh there's a portal here that i could go to that everything else around me goes away i mean you're totally unaware of the world around you for those moments that you are immersed in 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 putting paint to a canvas and uh and I just, I love the quality of the paint on these things, on these paintings. And, and as you know, because most of you have been there before, these are huge. These are great big pieces. I mean, he was, he was no um, shy retiring petunia. He was, he was, he was in for a pound all the way. And I love the way he mixes paint in buckets and, and, and put it down. It's just, yeah, it's really, really fun to see. But uh, this is another piece that I will challenge my students with. And once they they understand, boy, once they sink their teeth into this thing for the first time, it's like, oh my gosh, this is so great. I mean, here I have a ready-made, uh, I, I see a, a, a painted solution to what a concept that I'm wrestling with. And that's that's another thing, another way to aspect to this going and looking and studying at great paintings, because you're seeing painted solutions to a problem that that artist set for himself. And and it, it, it odds are that at, at some point in your your career, your your life, you were wrestling with a similar uh, challenge for yourself. And so you you learn where these some of these great pieces that you get very excited about where they are uh, where their home is and and you make intermittent pilgrimages to those places to study them once again to refresh and to and to have those great conversations with that painter again uh let's see if i have another Clifford here. Now these are his little studies, which again, in in and of themselves, are fascinating, because you can see this is a a pastel on a, on a tan paper, and you can see his thought process here. So you have this big area of neutral orange, this red and yellow, and blue. Again, I mean, he's this is a a theme that he plays off of all. I mean, constantly is the primary triad of red, yellow, and blue. There's there's very rarely secondary triads that you can now those dark pieces you'll see he's using a secondary triad in those meaning um, there uh, it's a it's it's a triad um, comprised of um, of like orange green and violet so you're that's a that's a secondary and then you have tertiary triads which are even grayer but each time you you step down from the primary it gets grayer and more subtle so uh but it but clifford most often stuck with this and so when you go to the museum try to identify the this the simplicity of his color plan and that just is that is so much fun to do. And plus, you come away with a great sense of accomplishment, like, okay, I think I'm beginning to understand him. 
<laughs> and then then he'll throw you a curve and go ah, wrong that didn't work oh and then we're back to that one again um i'd love to answer questions people might have because it's um if yeah you, you go want, ahead yeah if you want to un, uh, ask a question unmute yourself do you want to uh, stop the share screen or uh Skip sure, Wait, I can do that. Um, I just do I hit. Well, I can I can stop the share screen, or you have to shop stop the share screen. Okay, let's see new share. Like that. Well, it's yeah. huh? still there now. Stop share. There oh, can... there we go. Yeah. Get rid of this. So, come on. It's, it's not that early in the morning, guys. Surely you have questions. You've had your coffee. Come on. <laughs> uh, Skip, this is Jim Green. Hey, Jim. Um, how are you? Good. Uh, I'm, I'm new to this, uh, but I had a question. Uh, you started the, your discussion talking about the seventh chord. Right. And um, I didn't quite catch all that, particularly because you were showing the um, uh, the color palette. And uh, could you review that for me? Can you see this now? Hold I it raise it higher, you can, yeah. Uh, right there. Got it. Okay. Uh, let me get it right up close to the screen. And this this is a, uh, one of my working color wheels that I've marked out with a seventh chord. And you see those dark little triangles there, those arrowheads? All right, now I can see I can rotate, rotate the this the little arrowheads and they point to it. It'll create a different set of colors on a color wheel, and a, and a basic color wheel is comprised of twelve colors. So it's just like the face of a clock. I I, I think we we had talked about this. So a seventh chord, it's it works off the intervals of a four, three, two, three. That's what these intervals are on here. If you can, I don't know if those are big enough to see. I've even marked them. Yeah. I use this with my with my gang. And do you buy uh, a color wheel? Excuse me. Skip do you oh, buy oh yeah. These are oh uh Here's another one that I haven't, I haven't messed up. I mean, I, I do this, I, I do these for like teaching purposes, just to show my my crew, and uh, but yeah, in any art supply store they'll have these color wheels, and the 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 four three two three is you just simply count those intervals between, like you will on the hands of a clock. And you'll have a, a, a set of one set of colors, and then you move it, and you'll get a whole different set of colors. And then, um, I mean, that's that's kind of your your base that you're operating off of. You go, okay, well, I've established this. I know that this will give me the mixes in this set will give me what I what I want for my concept. And so you start building off of that. And uh, you know, it's. And I, I mean, I'm always referring to a, a painting, a, a studio painting. I paint a lot outdoors. So those, those I go outdoors for, for inspiration, for color notes, to um, just for effects, uh, plus the fact that I love painting outdoors. <laughs> I, it's, it's highly addictive once you, once you get you know, you, you get sucked into it. And um, I've been doing it all my professional life. And it's, I guess you might say, it's my, be like my form of golf. I can get away from everybody. And, and I, I have, I have a group of my best friends. And so you get, get four of us together. We call that a foursome and we go out and we just go out, but we'll go out and play golf for like five days away from home. And uh, and then 
and then we come home then we take those you know not every not every on the spot piece works for sure i mean i i mainly go for color notes and compositional suggestions and then come back i want to be pleasantly surprised when i'm outside i know i rarely go out with a a, a preconceived notion of what i'm looking for because you know you do that and you just no place quite fills that and so you move on well oh okay there's probably a better one over the hill and uh, you go over the hill yeah now nah, that's not what i was looking for well that's that's a wrong reason to go out there and because uh, the next thing you know you go over the next hill the next hill the next hill and then it's happy hour and you haven't gotten anything done and uh, so uh, so when they come back in the studio you have concepts that you can that that start to marinate and then what happens in the process is is you you get an idea or a concept and you start building that thing off of orchestrating your your concept what's you know what's going to work best a rectangle or a square a vertical or horizontal uh how extreme is it going to be is it going to be like a one by two in other words a 12 by 24 or a a 24 by 48 or is it going to be a 48 square like i showed you in that first image and uh, those are basic decisions you know how big what you know what dimensions are it going to, is it going to be and then you start orchestrating that space and it's just like building a structure you have to have a solid foundation under it before you can you know add the roof and um uh, so yeah, I mean it's and it's a labor of love. It's hard work, man. But it's it's something that many many days. I, at the end of the day, I walk out of the studio and go, "Dang, did that thing beat me up today?" But tomorrow's another day. Skip, how did you your your painting that's in the Benson Hotel? Mm -hmm. That's absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. Now, how take us through the process? you're saying you don't look at content first um right where is is that a content somewhere in colorado or oh it is it, it had to be and with a commission i mean i i i do commission you know i've done a number of commissions in you know over the years but if i take on a commission it has to be something that i want to do I don't, it, I mean, if it's something that I, that doesn't interest me, I'll just simply say, well, you know, I, I'm honored that you thought of me, but I'm not the guy for this one. Um, and I might offer a couple names because it, like I said, it has to be something I want to do. So when they called me about this, they said, they didn't put any restrictions other than we want a four foot square and we want it of color a painting of Colorado. I said, okay. So uh, I offered two little thumbnail color sketches, which I have I, right here. Now, here's the one for the, the one we looked at. And that's a little gouache study. I, is it too dark for you all to see? Yeah, we can see it. Uh, okay. There's that one. And then here is another option that I offered them, a winter piece. And I would be, I, like I told them, I would be more than happy to do either one of these because I'd love to paint them. And I had, I had on the spot uh, paintings you know, on location paintings from for both of these. That's what I based them off of or, were studies I had here in the studio. And so they selected the the spring or summer piece and uh, which was fine. And then then I pulled out my studies that were anything similar to to this this high country piece, which I have stacks of them here. And I pulled out the ones that were kind of the most cohesive for the 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 idea, and I could refer back to. And that is the value of the outdoor work: is that I trust my notes outdoors, my color notes, my value notes. 
I, I trust those implicitly, whereas a, a photograph will, is always skewed. It, it will lie to you. And it's, you can't trust the values. You can't trust the color. You can't I mean everything's, it's just a, it's a, you know, photograph is just an image of a thing and uh, uh, of stuff. And it has like, you know, I tell my students, you know, you go out there, a, a camera is a valuable tool in the field, but it has one eye and no brain. So what we bring to it when we do our painted studies out there is we do a lot of editing and we do a lot of interpretation to suit our own needs of uh, what we're looking for out there. And uh, so those, those are the notes that I trust. And uh, so then I start about going about the orchestration, so-called orchestration of building this thing from the ground up, good solid foundation. I know, okay, this is going to work. This is going to work. And, uh, you know, you start in on it and get it laid out. And then it's many days. It seems like it would be a lot easier to dig a ditch with a shovel than to face the music in the studio. So, <laughs> but, How long did it take you, do you think, from start to finish? Um, uh, well, I had I had planned on six weeks for that one from start to finish. But I had some interruptions in there. That's when our daughter died. And I had to, I mean, I lost about three weeks there. And um, so I had some some pretty significant interruptions. But in the end, I I ended up, I think, spending a probably a total of six weeks on it all together. So, um, Ellen, Leah has her hand up if you wanted to call on her. And I've been monitoring the chat, so I'll do any questions that come through there. Leah, I don't see her. Uh, I, I think. Um, she, oh, there she is. Top. I'll still pipe up. But first of all, my sympathies about your loss of your daughter. But oh, I wanted I wanted to say. Um, I really appreciate you bringing that um, Joan of Arc uh, painting to our attention. Um, it's the kind of painting that I would be in a museum that I might walk right by um, because I'm not too big into older stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, it, now that you've talked about it, it's a fascinating painting to me. Oh, it um, is. And it's going to help me uh, with other art to be able to appreciate other art. But I sort of uh, didn't hear the date or the museum <laughs> that it's in. Oh, it's, it's, it's in the Metropolitan Museum oh, okay. in New York. Mm -hmm. It's part right. of their collection. And when, and was it, it, when was it painted? Uh, it was painted, I think, 1870-something. Don't, I mean, don't. Don't take that something, to the bank. Something like that. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. in the 1870s. Um, yeah. It's just um, a fascinating painting. And the more you look at it, the more you see. Um, I didn't realize there were two figures in the background. I just saw one oh, figure. The ghost <laughs> figure of Joan of Arc is back. Yeah, there. and then yes. there's this other figure in the wall that I didn't see until you pointed out the sky. Right. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. Um, These I didn't see that at all. Yeah, you know, I I caution my students and, and and my and and when I when I talk to my students, I'm talking to myself also. But don't be too hasty to judge uh, a like dislike of a piece, mm -hmm. because if you spend a little time. Uh, developing even a little conversation with the piece you know and i and I, I i caution people forget the subject just forget the subject for a moment and look beyond that and that's why i mean i was never a big a big fan of clifford still until i stood in front of his work and i went holy smokes this guy was a genius and I don't, you know, I'm not, 
I'm not a non-objective painter, but if you will accept that all painting is abstract because it's just shapes and values and colors on the canvas, it's that's all it is. But what do those shapes and colors and 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 paint application and edges and and values? What do they do, you know, to me here when I look at those and study them up up close? You can you get a sense of of the joy or the agony that that painter had in executing that piece, and um, that's in in spite of Clifford Still's personality and and um, and antisocial behavior. His paintings are filled with joy. Mm. You can see it in the way the paint goes down. What I was talking about those close-ups, and that's that's just one way to enjoy his work is with your nose on the canvas, and then step back. I mean, you know, those things are enormous works. So many of them are, which is even more exciting because. Uh, when you stand within 10 or 15 feet of those great big canvases, you can't really see the edges if you're looking in the middle of it. So you're, you're, you're drawn into that environment. And that's what he in, intended for. I mean, that's what large paintings are. In, that, that's part of their purpose is to make you, the viewer, part of the work, part of that piece. So you have no choice because you become part of the environment. And, uh, and, and that's one of the fun things of bigger paintings because it, it really does. If you've done your work properly and thoughtfully, um, it draws the viewer in, and yeah. it has it has many layers, not just of paint, but many layers of meaning and and these alignments and these intersections that we kind of touched on here, and uh, yeah, and you know how you know. Where do these main shapes go off the canvas? Because those four edges and, and where a shape within those four edges goes off is really, really critical. I had one of my great design teachers when I was in school say, tell us, okay, the first, the, the most important marks on a canvas are the four edges because the first mark you put down on a canvas is the fifth one that's there. You have to count those four edges hmm. and everything that happens within those four edges has to relate in some way to those edges. Hmm. And um, yep, there was a question in chat um, and it had to do with your um, last study piece for the Benson Hotel Commission. Mm -hmm. and this person was asking, they thought it was black and white. Could you maybe oh. hold, have it there? Could you hold it up and just speak sure. to it a moment? Uh, no, it's a, um, it's a little, yeah, I know it's light in here. And let me see if I can just turn this. So it gets a better light. There, Does that work a little bit better? The second one, I think she was referring to the second one. Oh, this one. Okay. Yeah. This that one was right the here. one you did. Yeah, that one. No, it's it's a oh. uh, it's a very it has extreme contrast in it. And it's that, you know, that dark water and then the snow banks at the top. And uh yeah, this one of my one of my favorite painters is uh Franz Klein. And oh is an abstract expressionist. I just, uh, that's another painter. I, I love looking at his work and just the, the power, the inherent power that piece, ha his work has had. And um, so again, I mean, on a square, you can see um, if you're familiar with Klimt, then you can definitely see the what I've learned from him over the years as far as dividing the space up, what I was just talking about with that uh, high horizon line and uh, the strong horizontals with a few verticals. It's, I, I love doing that. And 
Yeah. So I mean, even though they didn't ex didn't go this route for that big commission, uh, I will still paint this at some point. Maybe not four yeah, feet square. Are you, it might are you be... going to 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 paint that one? Yes. Because I, I love the study. The study is wonderful. There is another um, question here. Sure. Um, because we're I don't know how long we're going to go, but um, I do want to get the questions out of the chat. Um, do you create in Photoshop? i.e. to achieve a specific color palette, do you create physical paintings only? That was the question. Physical paintings only. I'm, I'm, I know there are some of the, and I qualify this by saying, some of these younger artists that are way more adept at Photoshop <laughs> that do a lot of the, the heavy lifting, the early heavy lifting in Photoshop. And uh, one of them is a friend of mine, uh, David Dibble, lives over in Utah. And he's a master. I mean, I just really admire what he can do in Photoshop. But nah, I'm, I'm pretty much of a, I wouldn't call myself a Luddite, but I, I mean, I, I know just enough to be dangerous uh, <laughs> in Photoshop. And, and, you know, I can muddle through. Skip, do you have any other paintings in the Denver metro area? There's this one at the Benson Hotel that we might look go on a field trip to see. Uh, I I have a number of paintings, but they're all in private collections wow. in Denver. Yeah, I'm yeah, you know, um, yeah. I know when Peter Hasrick was was uh, the director of the of the Denver Art Museum, he had said, you know, we we really want to get one of your paintings in here, but then it didn't happen before he left. So, uh, so no, I wish I could say I did. I'm, yeah, no, there's uh, the Pioneer Museum in Colorado Springs has a big piece. Oh, um, that's worth it too. Um, there is one more question. Are you accepting students to your group? And if so, how do you, how does one join? Uh, the, in fact, there is a sign up period. We have three sign up periods a year. And uh, this one is going and is signing up, I think, till the 20th of this month, it started the 7th. And it, you, you go, go to, Tucson Art Academy Online, Tucson Art Academy Online.com. And that's where you'll find all the all the information about the 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 groups. There are six of us doing this. Matt Smith, I mean, they're all good friends of mine. Um, and um, the fellow that set this up is uh i mean it's that it's a smooth it just it works so well and uh i know there's my students all of our students just really enjoy the format and uh because you get a lot of time just like just like we're talking right now honey although it's not zoom it's another form where they submit these their work. I can I can pull it into a, some software. I can mark it up. I do a video where I'm talking to them and then post it back. So then they can get my conversation and then they can ask more questions on top of that. And um, yeah, it's a it's a, a really enjoying it. So, Is it a month long class? How many sessions? It's as many sessions as you want. It's 365 days. Oh, yeah, and it's you know there's no, yeah there's no set, and there there's no, really no 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 formal. Uh, this is where you start, and this is what you work through like projects. Uh, there are projects that I've set up to uh, to help them understand the basic forms of color. You know what I mean? So. Uh, like we just talked about, the seventh chord, double complements, complementary arrangements, uh, triads, uh, dynamic triads, and and uh, so they, they get to where they understand that, and then they start really. Then they're off to the races because they start plugging theirs in, and I throw 
I throw problems at them like, okay, here's a Clifford Still painting. I want you to interpret that and make it your own and and apply this to, or I might I might uh, throw a a, a project uh, or a challenge at them about edges, because okay, we need more lost and found edges in this. Everything's a hard edge. I mean, we need we need to lose edges. We need to know know where how to how to. So it's even though it's it's centered around color theory, practical what I call practical color theory for painters. Uh, it's also about the complete process of painting. <laughs> it's you, you can't really have one without the others, you know. So yeah, you have you have to understand all aspects and we talk about all aspects of paintings and look at great paintings and wow. break them down. I hope you've been a dear to give us this time. There's one more question and, and then I think we probably should wrap sure. it up just because we're starting to lose some people. But what galleries are you in if you are and where can someone purchase your, your works? Uh, I have two dealers that now represent me and that and that's it. Uh, I have simpson gallagher gallery in cody wyoming and sue i've been with sue for going on 30 years now she's my she's like my little sister but she is uh she is a unicorn of dealers she's she's the dealer that all of us have been with her all these years hold up as a gold standard she's she's great uh very approachable very, very kind. Uh, and I have another dealer in um, Ketchum, Idaho. And that is um, Tom Bassett, who used to be with Claggett Ray for many years in jail. And um, Wood River Fine Arts is Tom's, Tom's gallery. Great. That's wonderful. Uh, Skip, thank you. We cannot thank you again. Oh, um, Helen, Hannah, all of you, thank you for, I mean, I'm very honored and, and uh, to be part of your organization and, and having these discussions. Um, well, we hope to we have do something again. Yeah, we, we hope will. to have it, te it teaches us so much. It's so it, much. In, in how we approach a painting that even the ones we own. So it's, I always love it. You teach oh, me. So great. <laughs> great. Thank you, Hannah. I, I appreciate have, that. I have, okay. I have never liked Clifford Still. You have changed my mind. <laughs> I never liked him, but. Um, Hallelujah, sister. <laughs> yep. I have a new appreciation too. I'm, I'm yeah. just thrilled to go. Good, yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah, you go in with a fresh eye and, a, you know, a, 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 a kind of a, 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 a fresh, um, um, what's it looking for, Some, a fresh structure of, of, yeah. of looking well, at it. And, a more uh, educated eye, that's for yeah. sure. Yes, yeah, and it just makes it fun. You know, it just, it makes it so fulfilling for you guys as, as uh, people who enjoy, really love, have a love of art. Uh, just raises that level of of fulfillment by from studying these works and uh, yeah I, I mean I I get great joy out of it. <laughs> well, mad about art is mad about you, Skip. Thank well, you so much. I'm going to the Benson Hotel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's some great <laughs> paintings in there too. Boy, I mean they. They rounded up some. Great I think things. we might do a tour. Maybe we'll do a curated tour yeah. of them. They would love it. About that. They would yeah. absolutely yeah. love it. Great. That's a good idea. We'll do it. We'll do it yeah. really soon. The rest of you that are still on know that it, it sometimes takes a couple of weeks for the video to be posted on our website. But for those of your friends that might be interested, it will be a video on our website soon. So you can look for it and send your friends to it. Thank you. And there's still a little bit of room left at the Clifford Still. All right. If you're now interested. <laughs> All right, everyone. Yeah, you have a wonderful day, and I hope our paths cross again soon. Thank, thank you, Skip. You bet. Thank you. Bye, Bye now.